Yo, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. We're now turning the conversation to an issue of national concern, and it's the strike that uh, labor unions across the country are holding over the movement, the proposed movement of the minimum wage from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent list. And joining us to discuss this is former president of the Trade Union Congress, Mr. Peter Esele. Good morning, and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay, so there's so much debate about this issue, but for the benefits of those who don't understand, I want us to begin, you know, on that level playing field of understanding, really. Help us break down the trial of the exclusive list, the concurrent list and the residual list, and then what the grievances of Labour are regarding this. I, I think first, first of all, is uh, when you look at the exclusive list, it means these are issues that will be taken care of by, by the federal government, and the concurrent list. This has to do with what the state government can do, and uh, and one of the things that you have is that the national minimum wage happens to be the exclusive list, and what the current uh, leadership is trying to do is to take it over to concurrent list, which means every state can adjudicate and decide whatever they can pay or whatever they want to pay. And that is why you are having the Nigerian Labor Congress and the Trade Union Congress are up in arms against it. And why are they up in arms against it? I think uh, that the issue of minimum wage should be done by the federal government. And that is how it's done all over the world. But what, what exactly are the fears of labor regarding this proposed move to the concurrent list? One of, one of the fears of labor is that state governors are just going to go ahead and decide to pay whatever they want to pay. Because what you have right now, you have majority of them not thinking of paying the 30,000 Naira minimum wage that has been, that, that is law. So when you, have, when you have laws have been made, signed by the president, so what is expected is that it should be implemented. But what you have right now is that uh, very few states, not up to... Uh, I think about 60% of the states are paying, and you still have some states who are owing huge areas of, uh, of salaries to their workers. So this is one of the issues that you have while labor labor leaders are afraid. There, there is um, uh, an argument that you know the economy and uh, the cost of living in different states of the country are really not the same, and so it's unfair to expect the same um, uh, payment and, of course, uh, remuneration in a place like Zamfara and, you know, have the same thing in Lagos. Um, what's your response to that? I think, I think that is just uh, trying to give a dog a bad name in order to hang it. What's the definition of minimum wage? Minimum wage simply means the barest minimum. The barest minimum of payment that you expect that uh, a worker should, should get. And, and it, it, it also means that you have a standard. And we must have a standard. That is what is, what is done across the world. In America, for example, you have $7.50 per hour. That's the minimum wage. But in a state like Los Angeles, where you know that it's quite expensive, they don't pay $7.50 per hour. They pay more than that. So what you have is that the barest minimum and whatever certain, certain parameters are looked at before you arrive at the minimum wage. So if you say a state like Washington is paying 7.5 per hour, Los Angeles is paying more. But the federal government, that is the American government, will make a presentation to the Congress and say, Congress, this is what we think should be minimum wage. That is what is done in Britain. These are capitalist countries. This is where we borrow democracy from. And that is what they do all over the world. So once you get to that barest minimum, anybody can pay more. Right. Lagos can pay more because of how much revenue that Lagos generates. But Mr. Isele, Lagos in this case can only pay more, I mean, according to how some analysts will argue it, if minimum wage is now on the concurrent list. Why is Labour not optimistic that the minimum wage is at 30,000 no. oh, Just hold on, please. Why is Labour not optimistic that states who generate more funding, who generate more, would pay more to their workers? Why, why is this supposedly uh, driven by fear that they will actually pay less than they should? It's not a matter of they are driven by fear. You just have to look at the people that you are dealing with. <laughs> are these, do they keep agreement? And I'll tell you, I was also part of those who negotiated the minimum wage from 7,500 to 18,000 naira. And I'll tell you that majority of the states that made the presentation, none of them even made the presentation for 
18,000 Naira. They all made their presentation were all above 18,000 Naira. The, the why we arrived at 18,000 Naira was basically because of the informal sector. The only state out of the 36 states was, uh, was uh, Nasarawa that gave below 18,000 Naira. Nasarawa at that time proposed 10,000 Naira. So what you need to ask yourself is why are we worried? Why are we even why are we even talking about the fact that thirty thousand naira you can pay? How much is thirty thousand naira? Now, if we if we are going to look back, let me give you an example. Thirty thousand right now at four hundred and ten naira to the dollar is less than seventy. It's about seventy five dollars, and if you put that together, what you have is about two dollars. A little above two dollars a day. That is what we are talking about now. That is what you want an average family to live on. A family of, let me just say, six. So, and you let me also give you an idea to treat a malaria. Malaria, for example, is far more than that. So, if you are looking at all the parameters, those who are arguing, oh, why is Labour not being optimistic? Labour, we all know our government. We all know these governors. We all know what they stand for. So if you can't pay, there are some states that can't meet sal that have not been able to pay salary. Not that they are not able, but because of the of of how wasteful they can be. So these are the areas where you see these labor leaders. We they are talking from experience because they've dealt with all of this. They've dealt with this. Whether it's PDP, whether it's APC, they 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 are all the same. That is why you see they are worried. What do you, what do you, Mr. Salah? What do you hope that labor will achieve from these protests? Uh, and I'm asking, I'm asking in reference, uh, I'm at, in reference, and of course, uh, to all the times that Labour has come out to protest. How successful have those protests been? If you remember, not long ago, there was a, you know, talks about a protest, protest concerning the increment in electricity tariff. It eventually is still stuck, and nothing much was changed about it. Uh, we've also had, you know, conversations about protesting uh, increments in petrol price. Not a lot, you know, really has changed or has been done, you know, in that regard. So once again, how, you know, successful do you think this one will be? And do you think Nigerians really have a lot of faith in the Nigerian Labour Congress, the Trade Union Congress, all of them? You see, one of, one of the things that you have to look at is that they are using what they have. One of the things I, I, I advise that they should do is, first of all, you have to collect, collect the various data and then inform and educate Nigerians to know that, oh, we are not just only the beneficiaries of this. I'll give an example. When I, when I negotiated, uh, part of, part, I will be part of the team that negotiated 18,000 Naira. I work in an oil company. I'm not an 18,000 Naira person. But because we have to look at it from a composite perspective to let to make people understand that the, the woman, the man at the pump selling fuel at the pump station was a beneficiary of that minimum wage of 18,000 naira. The domestic staff that you have are beneficiaries of that 18,000 naira minimum wage. So when you see the body that's talking about 30,000 naira minimum wage, what they are talking about is the barest minimum. I will assure you that there is no member of Pendleton that is on that 30,000 30, naira minimum wage, not at all. And there's no member of Trade Union you know, Congress that is on that 30,000 naira minimum wage, not at all. But what we are trying to do, or what they are trying to do, is to make Nigerians to be aware that this is the barest minimum. And if you also want to grow your economy, people must have money to spare. If you want, if you if you are dreaming of being uh, one of the biggest economy in the world, what you need to do is to make sure that your people have money to spend. If they don't have money to spend, your your economy will shrink, and that is what we're talking about. When you don't have disposable income, how do you now? How do you expect your economy to expand? That's one. On the other hand, we're talking about whether Nigerians have respect or what have you have confidence in what labor is all about. First, if you talk about the pump price, even within the labor, labor movement, you have there's some discordant tunes. You have those in the oil and gas who feel that they just want the whole thing to go. And then you also have those who feel that, no, we have to moderate it. You also have those who feel that the government needs to be involved. So in other aspects, that particular area, you don't have, they don't have a unified front. But the issue of the minimum of which, I think they are unified in all of this. And I also think that they should be able to educate Nigerians and let Nigerians know that this is not just about labor movement. It's about growing the economy. It's about having good life for our, for our children. And it's about planning for tomorrow. 18,000 Naira is $76. And how do you expect a family of six? I'm just saying a wife, 
the husband and four children. How do you expect them to live on $76 in a month? And yet the government are saying they can't pay. Well, I mean, on the back of this protest, the uh, Speaker of the House of Reps, Femi Pejabiamila, has said he will meet with uh, Labour leaders. What should you be expecting, or should Nigerian workers be expecting from that meeting? I, I think the Labour leaders just have to go there and make them understand, and then bring, bring from what is done in other parts of the world. We are not, we are not an island. Because one, one very funny part of, that I find being living in this country and being in Nigeria is that we, we leave important things and we start dealing with tribals. And then you are taking away, if you say you want to decentralize minimum wage, why are you not decentralizing security? That is even what is more important right now. In other parts of the world, security is decentralized. Local government have their police, the state has their police, and then the federal government also has their police. But now you are, you are coming direct to talk about decentralizing wages, which is not done in other parts of the world. So if, if the Congress of America sets the minimum wage, then why is the National Assembly in Nigeria, which is equivalent to the Congress, also afraid of setting the minimum wage? I know most of them are under pressure from the governors, but I also think the speaker should stand and know that he's speaking for all Nigerians. I've always said the, the majesty of the state is the president, but the sovereignty of the, of the state is resided in the Congress. So I expect the Labour leaders to go out there and, and explain all of this to the speaker. And then the speaker should look at it and dispassionately so that you don't push everybody to the wall. People must have a reason to live. And if you take that away, you never can tell what will follow. Do you, do you um, or what would you say, uh, you know, are other ways that the Nigerian Labour Congress can express itself to drive a stronger point to the government? One of the ways is use of media, because I, I also have to talk to a lot of them, that they should use the media, they should be able to educate the people, and then strike is always the last option. Um, yes, I've led several strikes, but I'll tell you, for every strike that I was part of, I stopped eight. So, so strike is always the last option. Nobody is happy about going on strike because it's capital intensive, it's energy sapping, it involves a lot of planning. So for me, first thing is let everybody know this is why we are on the street. Let those in government also know this is why they are going on the street. And then the next thing is you have to mobilize and organize. Because the one thing that the labor movement have suffered in, the, in the recent times is that they have, they, they have what I call dwindling influence on political elite. If they've been able to organize and the political elite knows that the labor movement can go and make their life difficult in seeking re-election, they will be taking a lot more serious. You don't joke with COSATU in America, in South Africa. You don't joke with AFICIO in America. So all of these things, you don't also joke with TUC in, in the UK. So because they've been able to organize, educate, and they have a very strong research department that will come out with all the data, all the expense being incurred, all the spending by various uh, government, local council, and which we also now make the public to be aware and build pressure on those who are in power of authority. And so, so, so you're saying that they're not doing enough of public, public enlightenment um, with you know, this yes. current issue and others. Uh, and that's actually one of the reasons I asked the question about what you know, labor feels, uh, its relationship it really is with the Nigerian populace, with, with the people. Um, there's many people who, you know, when they hear about a strike now, a protest by labor, would you know, turn the other way because they're really not interested. Um, so do you think that needs to be fixed? Do you think that labor yes. needs to be able to you know, become a stronger body um, and, of course, be able to you know, get the support of Nigerians themselves so that whenever labor says that this is what they want or this is what they do not want, they have the voice and the backing of the Nigerian people. Because it doesn't, I'll be honest with you, it really doesn't seem that way currently. It, whenever Labour decides to go on strike, Nigerians really say, okay, is there going to be another strike? Oh, we'll stay at home. It's really, we're not so, so concerned. But how do you get the Nigerian Labour Congress and other, you know, um, uh, Labour bodies to be at a place where Nigerians themselves um, understand the passion that they fight uh, with, understand the reasons they fight and they protest, and are you know, going to be on their side all the time? I think it has to do with education. I, I, I don't think, I don't think labor movement right now, they're doing enough. They're, they're not doing enough in terms of educating the people. They're not doing enough in terms of uh, letting the ordinary man on the street to understand that this is the reason why they're on the streets. 
because I know I know in times past, by now you have leaflets, leaflets go around, and you have people in motor parks and everywhere trying to let people know this is the reason why. And over time, that has uh, that has not been done. So what you have now is is Nigerians just feeling that oh, fine, they want to go on strike. Why are they going on strike? I have spoken to a lot of them and say, why are you guys not talking? You need to let people know this is why you are doing what you're doing. And once you have that disconnect between between uh, the labor movement and the people on the street, then you face a major challenge. And I think that is one of the things that they are facing right now. But again, as we always say, the, the movement always at leave uh, the politicians. They, they, will always, they will always come back and it also have to do with the leadership. Sometimes you have... Uh, People in the private sector leads the organization. At other times, you have people in the public sector leave the organization. I think you always have a difference between when this leadership comes from public sector and the private sector, because the private sector leadership is more is more is more vibrant. It's also going to be it, it, it does not apologize to the government because it doesn't get a salary from the government. So what you have is depends upon who is leading. So whoever is leading at the moment, probably this is his own style, and then. How effective is the style will be judged at the end of his tenure. Hmm. So reacting to this protest, the Director General of the Progressives Governors Forum, Sally Lokman, has said that no amount of protests will stop the National Assembly from doing what they want to do and that the protests are in fact needless. Do you agree with uh, Lokman's stance and also what was the level of negotiations you know, that Labour had had with the federal government before they decided to take it to the streets. When when I I read I read the I read Luke Mann's uh, treatise on on it, and to be frank with you, I was also I was quite disturbed and also very 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 disappointed for him to say, uh, no matter the strike that uh, the governors or whoever is going to they will go ahead with what they want to do, because Luke Mann himself was also former assistant secretary general of Nigerian Labour Congress. So when you have all of all of these and people say um, people use those words that no matter what I think I think that is that that is not a word or a language that you use in a democratic setting. Those are language or words that you use in a military setting. You don't use the word no matter what. What we have to do is that we have to engage. We have to discuss. I have to listen to you. You have to listen to me. That is what democracy is all about. So if Labour is expressing what they feel, and somebody who is DG of uh, Nigerian Governors Forum says, no matter what, I think he's telling us that uh, it's dictatorship. Hmm. And I feel, and I, and, I, and I was actually going to reach him and also react to it, but I wanted to do it informally by saying uh, I, I was very, very disappointed with what he says because he too, who grew up in the labor movement, who is also part of it, understand the, 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 one of the pillars of the movement is that we have to debate. And then when we debate, whether you accept my views or not, but once there's a vote, majority carries the debate. Right. We don't use words like that in the democratic sense. And I'm disappointed with that. Uh, and uh, and uh, what, what is labor going to be bringing to the negotiation, uh, to negotiating table? Um, is Labour going to be willing to accept a flat, a fixed 30,000 naira minimum wage with other states, you know, given the ability to make changes here and there to maybe increase uh, uh, where necessary? I, I think, I think Labour is going to stick because that's a law. You see, you see, one of the things that we don't understand, there's the, there's the physical side of the society and there's the psychic, there's the psychic side of, the, of a country. And the physical side is you and I having this interaction, and then somebody is saying one thing or another. Then the psychic aspect of it is what, what message are you sending? If a government has no respect for its laws, so why are you blaming people who are... These are the things that may be responsible for some people carrying guns and carrying out some illegal activity because they don't have respect for the government, because they feel the government don't have respect for its laws. So if the president signed a minimum wage at 30,000 now, before we arrive at that minimum wage, all states, I know that for sure, because that's the process. All states are expected to make their own recommendation. And when these recommendations are made, that is when people do not arrive, after looking at the various parameters, do not arrive at the minimum wage. Don't forget that the workers started from about 65,000. Then later they moved to 56,000. 
before 30,000 was picked at, at minimum wage. That is negotiation. Nobody is imposing anything on you. And then in my time, we started several five, we also started at 45 or 50,000. Justice Gregory was the chairman of that committee. And finally, we have to agree at 18,000, at 18,000 naira minimum wage. The reason why we agreed to that was the informal sector who said they cannot survive if it's 30,000 naira, X number of people were going to lose their job. And then labor looked at it and said, okay, fine. So let's now accept the midpoint of 18,000 naira. So what labor is going to the table with is to let people know that the law is the law. If the government and the governors cannot even respect the law, so why would you blame a man who just who takes the laws into his hands? Because at the end of the day, that is what the government is doing. I don't care about the law. I don't care about uh, that I have signed minimum wage. So right now, it's as if you are playing soccer and in the middle of the game, you are, you are moving the goalpost. It's not done. So the government must show respect for its laws. And that way, we will be sending the message to all of us that here, this is Nigeria, we respect our laws. And that's the psychic aspect of the society that I'm talking about. Mm. When labor leaders took their protest to the uh, National Assembly Complex in Abuja, we had members of the Senate say that, and even promised labor leaders, that they will kill the bill, quote, this is, this is how uh, Senator Sabi Abdullahi put it. He said, the bill will be killed the way a similar one was killed during the 8th National Assembly. He's making this promise to Labour, but would you take his word for it? Yes, we'll give you benefit of a doubt. Sab Sabi, I've known Sabi for, for quite a while. Sabi and I were, were, were classmates at... Uh, Cambridge, so I know him and I know uh, what he's also capable of. So it's my belief that we'll give him benefit of a doubt and see how it goes. You, uh, you, you can't come out and say somebody is telling you this is what he's going to do and you say you can't trust him. No. Uh, you have to see him act it out before you can draw your conclusion. So right now, I think I'll give Sabi uh, benefit of a doubt. Okay. All right. Uh, of course, uh, we'll continue to follow up. Um, is there still going to be a, a protest every day until, you know, the, uh, the conversation is had? Um, I've also heard about a public hearing. It's one of the things that was, that was mentioned in the news this morning. Um, so does the protest continue until then? I think what they are going to do, I think the current leadership will make those decisions depending upon the feelers they are getting. So the public hearing will be very, very good for Labour to express themselves. And so the protest is also subtle pressure. They are not, nobody is telling you that they are shooting down anywhere. It's just a subtle pressure. And in a democratic norms, that is the, that is the options that they have. The labor can resort to violence. Labor can carry guns. No, that's not the way labor is made to, to function. Labor debates, labor protests, and labor make presentations. And I think that is what they are going to do. I don't see them going ahead to do anything that is illegal and that is against the law. OK, so. Um also, we know that the minimum wage is just one of the many, you know, issues that uh, the, the Nigerian Labour Congress is grappling with. What other challenges, apart from pay, you know, should Labour be putting, you know, uh, on the top of the table for the federal government to effectively address? I, I think one of the things that a lot of Nigerians uh, don't know, most of the things happens behind the scenes. It's only when you have breakdown that you see anybody on the street. A lot of conversation in between labor and government do happen behind the scenes. There are, there are so many issues that at the end of the day, you see changes in government policy, but you may not know that labor has played a role in having those changes because of uh, whatever happens behind the scenes. We also need to look at diversity in the workplace. Those are things labor need to also bring before government. Diversity is one. Number two, we also need to look at health safety and environment. What's the environment which workers are working? And then you also look at the education. I, I, I'm, I'm a believer that I'm not against government asking people to pay tax. I believe it's your, it's your responsibility to pay tax. You should pay tax for whatever you earn. And then the next thing is to ask what you do with the tax. If you take, for example, the Nordic countries, you pay workers pay tax as high as about almost half of their salary. But what you have at the end of the day is that they have quality education, quality healthcare, subsidized transport system. So once you have all of that, you don't really bother about about how much you are going to get paid. But the most important thing is that how secure is your future? How secure is the future of your children? Those are the things that drive workers. And I, those are the things I also think labor should give attention to. I think labor has been giving those attention, but they can still go ahead and let Nigerians to know that these are, these are, these are things that we need to face. 
challenges everywhere in the country. Your security is one. You have uh, workers can't go to work. You have teachers being kidnapped. You have students being kidnapped. I just got a report yesterday. There was one that happened at New State. So, so a lot of things going on in the country, and labor can't do it all. So, as citizens, we all need to stand up, speak up, and also offer help in whatever ways we can. All right. Peter yeah. Isela, uh, former president, Trade Union Congress, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, and of course, uh, like you know, earlier mentioned, uh, of course, you also agreed some of the work that needs to be done is uh, building a better relationship um, between uh, the Nigerian Liberal Congress and the Nigerian people. Um, we we'll would definitely be looking forward to speaking with you again. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we're moving now to talk the petroleum industry bill, the controversy surrounding it, and how South-South governors are demanding an increase. Uh, oh, let's take a break here, and we'll be right back to stay with us.